Have you ever considered that reading and studying texts, discussing them with others, makes us a very old and very active Jewish book group? Today in the Haftarah, we read and respond to the story of Hannah found in the book of Samuel. The story of Hannah was written down in ancient Hebrew years after it happened. It was canonized, included as one of the sections of the Hebrew Bible called the Prophets about 2,000 years ago. We have been creating and telling and writing down stories of our people for a very long time. I would not presume to tell you the original reason for this story's inclusion, nor would I presume to tell you what the original writers intended so very many years ago. I can only tell the story in the context of my own study and understanding. I invite you to read the story for yourself, and then we can continue our book group, our ongoing Jewish community of shared stories that we have inherited and wrestle with year after year. Our story begins in 1 Samuel, in the hill country of Ephraim. Hannah was the wife of Elkanah. She was beloved of him. Elkanah, as was the custom in those days, had other wives, another one in particular named Penina. Penina gave birth to several children with Elkanah, but Hannah did not give birth. This made her very sad. Elkanah loved Hannah and reassured her that she was beloved, whether or not she gave birth. Penina taunted Hannah for not increasing their tribe. Yes, at that time, what counted was a woman's ability to increase the tribe. During the year, several pilgrimages were made to Shiloh from their home to make offerings at the temple there. As Elkanah is leading his family to Shiloh, a location still existing in Israel today, Panina taunts Hannah. Panina would be what we would call today a mean girl or a mean woman. Hannah wants desperately to have a child. She approaches the temple and stands outside, eyes closed, lips moving silently, her entire body swaying as she sends her entreaty to God. Eli, the priest, sees Hannah and approaches her, admonishing her harshly. How dare you, in a drunken state, stand near the temple? Hannah replies, I was praying to God, asking the Eternal One to grant me the blessing of a child, and I would dedicate that child to God. Eli hears Hannah's words. He wishes that her prayer could be heard and her request granted. Wow, what just happened there? First, Hannah prays in a way never before recorded in our people's history. She prays silently and includes her whole body with the fervor of her being. You may be accustomed to such movement in prayer today, but it is Hannah who is credited, yes, Hannah, with giving us the model for individual prayer to God that we practice to this day. Second, Eli the priest rushes to harsh judgment of Hannah. He condemns her without asking for an explanation. Third, Hannah answers him. She is not afraid to explain her behavior to the priest. Fourth, Eli listens and changes his response and wishes her success in her prayer. There is a lot going on in this story. It contains many lessons. I will not tell you that all you have to do if you want something, something very badly, all you have to do is pray. No, indeed. But I would tell you that Hannah was having a silent conversation with her conscience, with God, the Eternal One. Call it what you will. 
to have an internal conversation, a self-reflection, is probably a good habit for all of us. Next, Hannah does not remain silent before Eli's accusation. She speaks up for herself. And the priest Eli, though Eli was quick to misjudge, he was also quick to listen and change his response and encourage Hannah. Hannah goes on to give birth to Samuel, who becomes an important priest in the developing history of our people. We Jews are amazing and creative storytellers, stories rich in meaning, many of them with a moral compass that points to goodness and kindness. We can take the Hannah story for its guiding ways to lead us into this new year.